Welcome to Ajuz a day. Uh, today we are going to be covering the 10th Juz, which begins in Surah Anfal, ayah number 41, and ends at Surah at tawbah ayah 92. Surah Anfal is ayah, Surah number 8, so it begins at 841, and it ends at 992. Surah number 9, Surah Tawbah, actually extends into the 11th Juz as well, uh, which the remainder of it will cover then. But if you remember from last time, we did not finish or we did not actually start Surah Anfal. Uh, we actually said we will start it today. So we're going to pick up from the very beginning of Surah Anfal, which is the eighth uh, Surah of the Quran. And it starts in the latter half or the latter quarter of the nine juz. So we'll pick it up there just to keep the, uh, the, the content, the flow of the content intact. The Quran, inshallah, is a very beautiful, uh, the study is a very beautiful study. And today, inshallah, I hope that you will benefit uh, from the study of this surah. Before I actually begin, I wanted to quickly mention uh, something about uh, the um, the translation that we're using. You might notice me using the translation of uh, Maulana Wahiduddin Khan. He is a scholar from India. And uh, today I actually learned that he passed away because of COVID. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive his sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept him uh, you know, in, among the righteous and to enter him into paradise and to accept this work that he has done for his book, Ameen Ya Rabbal Alameen. So this is uh, just something I wanted to speak about today and make dua for him. Uh, and I encourage you to also remember uh, him and any other of the righteous who have passed away in your, in your prayers. Okay. Yes, Aluna ka anil anfal. Wulil anfal ulilahi wa rasul. Fattaku laha wa aslihu that a bainikum wa ati ullaha wa rasulahu in kuntum mu'minin. They ask you about the spoils of war. Say they belong to God and his messenger. So fear God and set things right among yourselves and obey God and his messenger if you are true believers. Quick note about translations also is that if you were to use a more outdated translation uh um you might find let me just find like an outdated translation maybe something like uh hilali in khan uh the, the the there's a sometimes the, the translation would use about bounties of war or war booty that's what it's called so we don't use that term because i think you know the meaning of the word has kind of evolved over time what we're going to use is the spoils of war that's the term that we will use for anfal and that's where the name of the surah comes from al-anfal the spoils of war they ask you about that okay true believers are those whose hearts tremble with awe at the mention of god and whose faith grows stronger as they listen to his revelations. And they are those who put their trust in their Lord. They are the ones who regularly pray and give in alms out of what we have provided for them. Those are the true believers. Such are the true believers. They have a high standing with their Lord, his forgiveness, and then honorable provision will be made for them. This is the beginning of Suratul, Suratul Anfal. Now, what is uh, this, the theme of the Surah? The theme of the Surah continues to be good versus evil. Good versus evil. And if you are actually re, uh, you know, counting, we actually did in the uh, eighth juz, we said it was a battle of good versus evil in the eight juz when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about uh, you know, the prophets that Allah had sent and how uh, this was a battle that raged between good and evil from that time, beginning with Adam and Iblis and continuing with all the prophets like Nuh, Hud, Salih, Lut, and Shu'aib. Then yesterday we did, you know, good versus evil part two, which was the story of Musa, salam, right? The story of Musa versus Fir'aun. And that was something that we observed in the, uh, in the ninth juz. Today in the 10th juz, we have the same theme, good versus evil, but this time part three. And the part three is the Prophet ﷺ against the Quraysh and against the hypocrites, the people who 
uh, pretended to be believers, but they were not believers. In fact, they were agents uh, trying to disrupt, agents trying to cause chaos amongst the believers and their ranks. So this is the theme of this surah and this juz as well. Now, as we are to explore this, uh, there's a couple of things that need to be uh, pointed out, which is the use of the word anfal in the very beginning of the surah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word anfal, uh, spoils of war. And he says, they ask you about the spoils of war. Hmm? Uh, this is an interesting beginning. Uh, it, this, the surah is going to speak about the battle of Badr. Okay, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually speak firstly about something that takes place after the Battle of Badr. After the Battle of Badr, the Sahaba had a, a confrontation amongst themselves, not armed confrontation or physical confrontation, but they had a uh, dispute. And the dispute was about who gets to keep the spoils of war after this victory. In fact, we find this in the books of uh, Sira and Tafsir that Ubadah ibn Salamit who narrates that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ubadah ibn Salamit that خرج رسول الله صلى الله عليه بدر فلقوا العدو the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم went to Badr and they met the enemy which is Quraysh فلما هزمهم الله اتبعتهم طائفة من المسلمين يقتلونهم وأحدقت طائفة برسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم when the Messenger of Allah went to fight his enemy, uh, the there's a group of people that went out and started to battle on the front lines. And there's a group of the Sahaba that stayed back with the Prophet Sallam and uh, you know, protected the Prophet Sallam. Uh, the Battle of Badr, as we will uh, see, was a battle against all odds. The battle where uh, the Muslims were going to go and they were going to strike at a caravan, a trading caravan, armed with maybe some basic security people, okay? What ended up happening is they ended up encountering an army armed to the teeth. The numbers were uh, quite skewed. The army of Quraysh had a thousand people. The Muslims were about 300, but not just the numbers. Three to one is a, a significant disadvantage, but cavalry, the Quraysh had over a hundred ca cavalry. The Muslims had only two horses in cavalry. That is, you know, a, a that's a disaster. That's a disaster. So now, as this battle was starting to, as the battle formation started, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba who were protecting him stayed a little bit behind because they didn't want the uh, Quraysh to attack and completely uh, run through the Muslim ranks and then come and kill the Prophet ﷺ. That would be a disaster. So uh, that was the case. Now, after uh, the battle uh, was done and the people who were battling on the front lines, obviously they were the ones who uh, Allah subhanahu wa put the victory in their hands. And also, as you will see, uh, there were angels that came down uh, to help them. Uh, but, you know, in, in, in a uh, more physical sense or in a, in a more logistical sense, they won the war, all right? They won the battle. The other Muslims stayed behind and were basically protecting the Prophet uh, So there was a bit of a, a, a dispute between the two parties. Uh, the party that was fighting in the front lines were like, uh, they say, well, it's, we are the reason, we are the ones who pursued the enemy and through us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the enemy. So all of this uh, spoils of war are going to be for us, right? And those who stayed behind would say, no, actually, we are going to get, we, will, we should get these spoils of war because we stay with the Prophet we didn't want the Prophet to get harmed at, at all. And this was now a uh, back and forth, back and forth dispute. And at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, Yes, alunaka anil anfal, qulil anfalu lillahi wa rasul. All right. That is the background that we find ourselves in when we are talking about this surah and this revelation and this ayah. Now, I want you to appreciate something here, please. I want you to appreciate the Quran's style. The Quran uh, is you're going to use a tangential method to, uh, to, to, to talk about the problem at hand. The problem at hand is not about who is going to get the spoils of war. The problem at hand is 
the Sahaba are differing over worldly gains. They're having a dispute about worldly gains, about money, right? Now, you could say, well, the Sahaba were in desperate situation, which is true because the people that came from Mecca and lived in Medina had almost nothing, right? So they were barely able to eat. So you could not blame them for prioritizing these things because they desperately needed anything that they could get to sustain themselves. But that's still besides the point. The point remains, the root cause is how come you are disputing about worldly material material gains. That is the problem. And that root cause Allah SWT is going to address first. And then he is going to go and, and, and explain uh, you know, the ruling, the actual ruling about how this, uh, this, this war, spoils of war, how they're going to be distributed. So this is the tangential method the Quran takes. It starts by the question, but then instead of addressing it, first it takes a tangent to talk about uh, related matters, arriving at the root cause of the problem, addresses the root cause, and then comes back to the uh, the, the problem at hand. So here Allah SWT first describes, ayah number one to four, who are the true believers. They are the ones who, uh, you know, they fear God. For them, what matters is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the word anfal, right, is from the word nafil. Nafil is an optional thing. If you pray nafil prayers, it's an optional prayer. Anfal is a secondary thing. The primary goal of you fighting is to, you know, protect Islam, is to, uh, you know, honor uh, the Prophet Sallam, is to raise the flag of Islam, uh, to, uh, you know, fulfill your duty, not to gain uh, spoils of war that's not your primary goal and if it is problem that's a problem it is not supposed to be you also fear God and set things right among you the true believers are the ones that when their uh, their hearts tremble with awe at the mention of God right look how nicely Allah SWT is reminding them your hearts should be trembling right now and their faith should go stronger as they listen to the revelations your iman should be going up as Allah is describing I was about to tell you what is going to be the solution to your problems. Your trust should be in your Lord. Your trust should not be in these material things that you're get, grabbing, thinking that's going to sustain you. Your Lord is going to sustain you. Hmm? That is how Allah SWT starts off this thing. And again, I want you to appreciate, this is right after the battle of Badr. This is the best of the Sahaba. Yet when Allah SWT sees them doing something incorrect, He is going to step in and correct them through revelation. You know, and uh, when they for what they did as to what is praiseworthy, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is going to praise them. Okay, uh, the battle of Badr, the details of the battle are known, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is going to uh, make you know uh, references to it. Right, He's going to infer uh, certain uh, instances of the battle, assuming you already know the details, so you can kind of piece together the puzzle. Okay, here are some inferences uh, that the Quran makes. Number uh, I number five. As it was your Lord who rightfully brought you forth from your house, even though some of the believers disliked it, they were disputed. They were they disputed with you concerning the truth after it had become manifest, as though they were being driven to their death with open eyes. This was something uh, previous to before the battle took place. The the, the, the Sahaba were quite uh, afraid of going out to confront uh, this this uh, this caravan. Hope uh, you know in the fear of a, a, the, the Qurayshi are uh, the Qurayshis will send an army, right? And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said this. He said, "God promised you one of the two parties would fall to you. Either you're going to get the caravan, or you are going you are going to go and meet your enemy and in, in battle, okay? And you wanted it to be the one without sting. You wanted the easy way, but God wanted something else for you. He wanted to establish the truth by His words and cut off the root of those who deny the truth." Hmm? You wanted the easy way out. You wanted just the quick uh, gains of the caravan, the money that comes with it, and the easy fight. But Allah wanted you to go through a more difficult battle, uh, maybe slightly less material gain help looks like. Now you know what trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually means. You have lived it. And that is the most invaluable thing you can gain. That is completely priceless. There is a mental preparation that took place for the battle. I number 11 references that mental preparation. When the believers were getting ready to, uh, to, to fight, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, sent, uh, firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told, told the, the Prophet ﷺ he's going to send an aid, an aid of angels, a thousand angels in succession. And they are going to come and fight uh, with you. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has answered the Prophet's dua for help in this way. And this was one of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? But then the believers, they didn't see the angels until the battle had started. So now they are probably going to be if you're if you're if you're about to go into a battle and you are outnumbered and out you're going to be outgunned you are going to be extremely stressed out but the prophets the, the sahaba and the prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them into a deep sleep just so that they could be mentally and physically ready for the task at hand which was the battle of Badr the next day okay this is a very nice thing he brought drowsiness upon you to give you his reassurance and send down water from the sky to purify you, right? This is what uh, you know. An, a good night's sleep and a good shower in the morning will do. It will freshen you, and now you can confront your problems head on. It speaks about the importance of getting, you know, a meaningful rest. Yes, this is something we should uh, consider uh, as a way of recovery. Subhanallah, the Quran references that as well. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would send angels. To help, as we mentioned, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Lord commanded the angels, saying, "I am with you." So make those who believe stand firm. For thabbitul ladina amanu, strengthen the believers. Okay. Uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, uh, you know, would uh, make this right. Would make this a great victory. Ayah number, uh, ayah number um, seventeen. Excuse me. Uh, this was a great victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was you did not kill them, it was God who killed them. And when you threw sand at them, it was not you. It was Allah who threw. So that he may confer on the believers a great favor for him, uh, from himself. Surely God is all hearing and all knowing. That is what happened. And surely God will undermine the design of those who deny the truth. What is this talking about? This is talking about that in the beginning of the battle, the Prophet ﷺ was commanded by Allah to take some sand and uh, and throw it at the opposing enemy. Now, if you take sand and you chuck it, it's not going. It's not going to go very far. But this sand went and uh, and each and every one of the disbelievers' eyes, a poor, a piece of that sand went into his eyes. And Allah SWT says, "This is not you who did it." It was Allah who did it. The idea is victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This help came to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So trust him. Trust him. Why are you forgetting about this and getting caught up in the spoils of war? Right? This is the problem here when you think you are prioritizing the gains of this world. When that starts to happen, that is a problem. Uh, the Quran reminds the believers, Oh believers, obey God and his messenger and do not turn away from him. Uh, now that you have heard all, okay? Don't be like those who say we hear, but they pay no heed to what they hear, right? These commands that Allah is giving you is to help you. It's to make you better. It's for your own benefit. Don't be like those who hear and then kind of, you know, make it uh, like they, they hear what you say, but they really didn't process it or they weren't interested in hearing what you have to say. Don't be like those people. Oh believers, you will see this expression repeat a lot in this uh, in this uh, surah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Believers, obey God and his messenger. When he calls you to what gives you life. Ida da'akum lima yuhikum. Subhanallah. The religion is what gives us our life. The religion is what invigorates us. When Allah calls us and invites us to the practice of, of, of his faith, that is supposed to invigorate us and give us life. Understand that, and that's why you should uh, respond to Allah and His Messenger by following the Quran and following the Sunnah. Very, what a very, very tough ayah. This is a very tough ayah. Hmm? Understand that God stands between a man and his heart, and you shall be gathered in His presence. Meaning, if Allah wanted to very quickly, He could, you know, misguide you. He could very quickly come in between you and guidance reaching your heart. Hmm? So be cautious of that. Be mindful of that. 
respond before it's too late. Don't, uh, you know, become stubborn or don't procrastinate because that could become a reason for the denial of guidance reaching a person's heart. Hmm? Uh, don't betray, ayah number 27. Allah SWT, you see like before Allah SWT addresses uh, the, uh, gives the answer to the question of what's going to happen to the spoils of war, Allah SWT is going to give some reminders to the believers here that recalibrate your worldview here. You, you guys messed up. Let's let, recalibrate uh, your worldview here. Okay? Uh, remember that you were weak and few, but Allah helped you and Allah saved you. Oh, believers, don't betray God and His Messenger. Don't betray or violate your trust. We spoke about the importance of trust in Surah Maida. Okay? You made the commitment to fight in this particular surah. It's talking about the fight of the battle of Badr. Don't you know walk that back now. You made some commitment, you honor that commitment. Know that your wealth and children are a trial. And that Allah, there is an immense reward with Allah. In the Allah, Allah, and that there is an immense reward with God that is in store. The idea is don't let your calculations about like the cost benefit of some action in the world, uh, don't let that stop you from doing what's right. Don't let that stop you from doing what's right. Don't let that violate you. Uh, don't let that uh, let you violate your your commitments or walk them back because that uh, is going to be that now your wealth and children that analysis you're doing about should this is this worth it or not that becomes a trial for you something that is taking you away from what's right uh, and again as another reminder ya oh believers if you are uh, if you are if you fear God, if you're conscious of Allah, He will grant you furqanan. Furqan is from the word faraqa. Faraqa is or farraqa is to separate something. Furqan is the thing that separates. He's going to give you the ability to separate what's good and what's evil, what's truth and what's falsehood. He's going to give you that ability. Right? The theme of this surah and the previous two juz was good versus evil, right? A historical look at it, right? You want that ability to distinguish between good and evil? Fear God. Ittaqullah. Be conscious of Allah. Know that He's watching you. Know that He is uh, going to, uh, if, if He chooses to, hold you accountable. Hmm? Understand that and act that way and then Allah will give you the ability to distinguish between truth and falsehood. And any mistakes you make, will you kafir ankum sayyatikum? He will forgive your sins. And He will forgive your sins. Twice this repeats. Right? This expression repeats twice in two different two different sentences. He will forgive your sins and He will forgive your sins. What? Uh, why would it this repeat twice? Number one is for, for, for the sake of emphasis. Uh, number two is actually sayyat is perhaps a type of sins uh, that is different than... Uh, the type of sins being referred to here by yaghfir lakum. Sayyat perhaps are sins where you miscalculated and you erred. Hmm? But you did that mistakes. And yaghfir lakum are sins you did maybe out of being oblivious, not even even not even recognizing that perhaps now you have stepped your uh, overstepped your bounds. He will forgive those as well. All sins he will forgive as long as you have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, this is a conditional sentence. If you fear God, then he will do, number one, يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ فُرْقَانًا Give you the ability to distinguish between truth and falsehood, good and evil. Number two, he will forgive your sins, the big ones. And number three, he will forgive your sins, the small ones. Hmm? All of those, like all that is the then part. And the if part is if you fear God. Because Allah is limitless in His bounty and His uh, and His mercy, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reminds the the Sahaba and all of us by extension that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala can you know help the Prophet Sallam or will help the Prophet Sallam against all odds. He was alone. He was about to be assassinated 
but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, prevented uh, him from and, and rescued him from that situation. A very interesting tangent here from ayah 30 to ayah 33. The Prophet and the Quraysh, what a very interesting dynamic. Quraysh knew who the Prophet was. They saw him grow up in front of their eyes. They knew this is the most truthful person, the most trustworthy person. Before the Prophet called them to Islam, his judgment was universally accepted by Quraysh without any any dispute. They knew he was not a man of prejudice. He wasn't going to just favor his own. They, That's how much they respected him and that's how highly they viewed him. But then as the Prophet started to invite them to Islam and told them that you cannot worship idols, you have to give up these idols, what he was saying to them also was that you have to give up a source of your income. Because the idols was a big source of income for Quraysh. The people would come from all over the parts of the world, uh, all parts of Arabia. And the idols in the Kaaba would be a source of business for Quraysh. Because these people would come, they would do business and trade. Quraysh would make money, right? Uh, you take away the idols, maybe these people stop coming. Maybe there is no more, uh, the, the people coming to the Kaaba are lesser. Uh, just because we embrace this. So the Quraysh were seeing this from a theological point of view and they were opposed to that theologically, but also a financial point of view because they were businessmen. And they're like, this is bad for business. This is not going to be good for business. So Allah SWT said something very interesting about this. He said, When our revelations are recited to them, they say, we have heard them. If we wish, we could produce uh, the like of them. We could do this if you wanted to. They are nothing but ancient fables, uh, fables of the ancients. In Hada illa asatirul awali. They said, Oh Allah, if this really is the truth from you, then rain down upon us stones from heaven or send us some other painful punishment. But Allah is not going to punish them while you, Prophet, were in their midst, nor will Allah punish them as long as they sought forgiveness. Allahu Akbar. They asked for Allah's, you know, wrath to be unleashed upon them. Condition, they were like, hey, if this is the truth, okay, Allah, then destroy us. And Allah SWT says, he's not going to destroy these people while you were still in Mecca. Because the Prophet is a mercy. And Allah's mercy cannot be in the same place as Allah's punishment. Okay? So that was not going to happen. And then also Allah was not going to punish them because يستغفرون, there were people amongst the Quraysh who had secretly embraced Islam, who were not, you know, uh, coming out as Muslims. And they were making dua for the forgiveness of their people. And the Prophet was making dua for the guidance of his people. So as long as that was happening, that kept Allah's punishment at bay. Hmm? Uh, there... Um, there, there, this is something uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about uh, the people of Quraysh that um, their relationship with the Prophet was a very, uh, was a very strange one. Going from uh, someone who, from a relationship of full trust to full animosity uh, and completely, uh, you know, acting completely irrationally. If this is the truth, Right? Look at this, what the sentence says. If this is the truth, then rain upon us punishment. Shouldn't you say, if this is the truth, oh Allah, allow us to accept it? Shouldn't that be, like, this isn't, isn't that the rational, uh, you know, way of approaching it? So Quraysh really turned very toxic. And at that point, in this part of the Prophet's life, there was very little that they were going to hear from what the Prophet had to say. Okay? Ayah number 37 mentions that the uh, good and bad that uh, comes in life is a way for Allah to bring out the best amongst us, right? The difficulties are meant to bring out the best uh, or, or uh, are, are meant to bring out the best of us. Uh, so this is something that's it, that is important. Uh, this is a difficult trial uh, that the people are going through right now in, in Mecca and, and the, the people who recently migrated to Medina, but it's going to bring out some goodness in it you wait and you see. And this is true for everything. All things that happen in life, there is some goodness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring out through it. So just be patient until you see it. Ayah number uh, 
Um, Ayah number 41 is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally answers the question after love with the Sahaba. All the reminders about why they should reprioritize, uh, you know, fix their, pri their priorities, focus on Allah and His Messenger, obey Allah and His Messenger, uh, don't get caught up in, in, in just the worldly, uh, worldly gains. You know, honor your commitments, be truthful, etc., etc. Hmm? All those reminders, now Allah tells them what is the ruling of is one fifth of your battle gains belongs to God and the messenger and the messenger to his close, close relatives and the orphans, and the needy, and the travelers. Okay. And the other Four fifths are distributed equally among the entire army. One fifth goes to the Prophet ﷺ for him to distribute it to the orphans, the needy, to his relatives, and for him to keep it himself. Because the Prophet ﷺ is not actually working uh, as like a shepherd or as a businessman, right? He actually and the 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 state of the Muslims doesn't have any income tax, uh, he, so the Prophet ﷺ is paid a salary or something. That's not how it worked. So the Prophet ﷺ and the state's social welfare programs to take care of its orphans, you know, its needy, its travelers, orphans, particularly because, you know, the men who died in battle, who's going to take care of their families, right? Someone has to take care of their families. All of these people, uh, they're supported by the spoils of war, a fifth of them, okay? And the other four fifths are distributed among the fighters equally. It doesn't matter who was fighting what. So this is a very interesting uh, thing the Quran says about how, before answering the question, the question was asked in ayah number one, what about the spoils of war? The, qu the question is answered in ayah number 41. Hmm? And in the middle, Allah SWT is, you know, sending reminders to, uh, for, to the Sahaba to reprioritize themselves. And this is something, that's a beautiful approach that we could take. If we are trying to, you know, do some conflict resolution, uh, in whatever capacity, this is an interesting, a very beautiful approach to take, which is to uh, address the root cause of the conflict, to address the underlying problem, hmm? not just the surface level symptoms. And that's what the Quran focuses on, addressing the underlying problems uh, first, and then the answer to the real, to, to the actual, uh, you know, question at hand. Okay. Uh, Surah Tawbah continues to give some reminders about uh, the uh, the to 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 recall or to uh, you know remind the believers about the battle of Badr, how against the odds that victory was. That victory was so against the odds uh, that uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala helped the believers through perceptions. Okay, he showed them, I number 43, God showed them to you in your dream as a small number. If he had shown them to you as many, you would have lost heart and disputed about the matter. But God saved you. He has full knowledge of what is in the human heart. Like the believers didn't see the full extent of the Qurayshi army. And thus the perception was like, this is not an impossible battle. That's a very important thing. If you're going into a battle, if you're going into a fight, if you're going into a test thinking you're going to fail, guess what? You are going to fail. Okay? <laughs> so here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't let them, their minds go there. And he helped them this way. And on the flip side, he, uh, on the time of the, when, the, when they met, and you, when at the time of your encounter, he made them appear few in your eyes. It didn't seem like they were an overwhelming number. It seemed like this was manageable. It's within reach. And he made you appear few in their eyes. So they were like, these guys are nothing. This is a, a joke. They got overconfident. The believers didn't lose confidence and Quraysh got overconfident. And Allah SWT did that Allahu amran kana maf'ula so that it was so that God might God might bring about that which he had been which had been decreed and everything returns to God. A very uh, beautiful you know expression. It was Allahu amran kana maf'ula. 
This thing was already a done deal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to make it happen. This is how he chose to make it happen. Okay. Uh, a few reminders uh, uh, to the believers, uh, you know, about how you can be victorious, right? How is it that you can be victorious in life? Hmm? Uh, number one, be firm. Be firm, right? Here in the context of a battle. By the way, when you think of a battle here, uh, keep in mind the Prophet was the general. He was the commander in chief as well as the messenger of Allah, right? So the commands given to him and the Sahaba, uh, it's like the commands given to an army, right? So this is now, think of it like being told to the army of uh, you know, the Muslims. When you, are in, in the, in, when you encounter a party, when you're about to fight, remain firm and remember God much so that you may succeed. And this is a beautiful thing. The Quran always infuses this tazkiyah, this remembrance of God. You know, in acts of worship, when it's talking about fiqh, wudu, wudu is this, wudu is that, wash your face, wash your hands, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it's done to purify you. It's not done to make your life difficult, right? The uh, purification of the soul is mentioned along with the rulings. Here, the ruling is how do you fight? What should be your attitude towards fighting, right? The attitude should be, you know, uh, be firm. Don't run away, okay? Don't be a coward, be brave. But also, Seek help by remembering Allah. And that's the purification that's been infused here. Very powerful and very, very beautiful. Also, don't argue. Don't become, uh, don't get caught up in disputes. Obey God and His Messenger. It says avoid dissension. Better transition would be avoid dispute. Avoid disputes. What happens when you're disputing? Then your if you were to dispute, you will falter and lose. And your strength is going to wither away. Subhanallah, that's what happens when any group starts disputing uh, and falls into and gets consumed by dispute. Right? It does you can look throughout history, right? You can look at like example after example of downfall of every great empire or every you know movement whatever you the, the you will find this to be the case they fell into dispute they got consumed by dispute and dispute often turned into armed dispute right it wasn't just like a debate it turned into armed dispute and that would open the door that would open the door for what for the enemy to come and uh, and win, right? That would فَتَفْشَلُوا That would open the door for your loss and that would open the door for you losing all that you have gained, your strength. And this is exactly what happened in the Battle of Uhud. Remember, Badr was in the second year after the Hijrah. Uhud was in the third year. Exactly that. The Sahaba disputed and because of their dispute, the uh, Qurayshi army was able to ambush them and attack them and then the battle that was supposed to be won ended up being a lost battle. So this is a very important re reminder. This is how you're victorious. Remember Allah, be firm in battle. Don't fight among yourselves. Don't dispute amongst each other. Okay. Another important reminder is uh, ayah number 60. Okay. Um, uh, ayah number uh, 60. If I can get to it, there we go. Alhamdulillah. Prepare any strength you can muster against them and any cavalry which with you with with which you can overawe God's enemy and your own enemy as well, and others besides them whom you do not know, but are known to God, you know, to, to be victorious, you have to be prepared. You have to have strength. You have to be advanced, right? Uh, this is the idea. You have to have strength. Cavalry. Cavalry was a, is an expression of being advanced in terms of like uh, militarily. Okay? And if you become weak and uh, not you know, you know backwards militarily, then all of a sudden you are uh, you know your 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 easy game for whoever is coming and fighting you. Okay, uh, 
another another important instruction is to be united okay be united wa in yuridu an yakhda'uka fa inna hasbaka Allah be together be united wa allafa bayna qulubihim Allah is the one who brought your hearts together uh, you know be together in this cause and you will be uh, you will be uh, strong okay uh, this is uh, some instructions in this uh, in this uh, surah Uh, there's a couple of other interesting things I wanted to show you from this surah. Okay, uh, one interesting thing is uh, a parallel between Musa and Fir'aun, or more precisely, a parallel between Fir'aun and Quraysh. Okay, uh, Quraysh here, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes as they are uh, dying in the battlefield. The angels, ayah number 50, they're taking the souls of the These these worst of the worst. These are the people who knew the Prophet the best, rejected him the most in the most violent and most uh, disgusting way, and now they're meeting their end. Okay, this is the worst of the worst. So when you see the angels taking their soul, hmm, they strike their faces and their backs. This is a way of humiliation at the moment of death. And saying to them, taste the burning, the punishment of the burning of the fire. That's where you're headed. That's what the angels are saying. It's not because Allah Subhanahu wa is vengeful or lusting after uh, after punishing His servants. No, this is a punishment for what your hands have committed. Uh, better translation: This is a punishment for what you have earned. Qaddamat aydikum is what you have put forward, i.e. the actions you have done. That's an expression in old Arabic. All right, meaning this is what you have earned. This is the this is what you're this is what you're reaping. That's what you sowed, and now you're going to reap what you sowed. And Allah is not going to wrong anybody in the least. This is this is justice from Allah, not uh, oppression. Kadat bi ali Fir'aun, ayah fifty-two, like Pharaoh's people and those that have gone before them, they rejected God's signs and God sees them for their sins. For God is strong and severe in punishment. Very interesting parallel. I want you to notice this. It comes in the Quran in a few places. For example, also in surah number uh, surah number three, uh, Ali Imran from quite a while ago, right? Uh, this same expression appears here, ayah number ten. Those who deny the truth, their wealth and children will not help them against God. They will be fuel for the fire. Their end will be like the Pharaoh's people and those before them. They denied our signs. So God sees them in their sinfulness and God is stern in punishment. You see, this is the parallel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us, is trying to draw Quraysh, you're going to be like the Pharaoh. That's what. That's the path you're headed. In fact, that is where you have ended up. That's what you chose, and that is how you ended up. All right. The surah ends uh, with Allah subhanahu wa taala. Uh, sorry, the point number two that's interesting here is uh, about peace. This is talking about war. You're like war. Wow, so much war. What is up with that? Well, it also speaks about peace. Okay. And this is the thing that's very beautiful. وَإِن جَنَحُوا لِسَلْمِ فَجِنَحْ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Ayah 61. If they should be inclined to make peace, if they're inclined towards peace, فَجِنَحْ لَهَا Then make peace. Immediately accept it. Right? It's not like they are wanting peace, so you take. Uh, you also want peace. They're just so inclined to it. Right, there's a slightest bit, bit of inclination from them that they don't want to fight. Immediately, you take that and pursue that and make peace with them. وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ and put your trust in God. Surely He is the one who hears and sees. But if they want to deceive you, don't worry. Allah will take care of you. When you read when يَخْدَعُكَ فَإِنَّ حَسْبَكَ اللَّهِ they want to deceive you, don't worry. Allah is going to take care of you. He is going to protect you and whatnot. So this is ayah is a very important ayah because it tells us what. It tells us that in Islam we have uh, we have uh, the instruction for what happens in war because war is a part of uh, of life and history. You cannot; it's a it's you. You have to be uh, misguided 
or ignorant to deny that because this is just the way it is. So there's instruction about war and how to handle that. But what the Quran says is always peace is preferred. If they incline towards peace, you accept that inclination and you immediately sign uh, a peace deal. In fact, as we'll see in Surah number 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Treaty of Hudaybiyah a great victory. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah was a peace treaty. Okay, so this is a very beautiful thing that the Quran expresses and um, and that is uh, something for us to consider as we study the ayat that speak about battle and whatnot. Surah Tawbah is the next surah, surah number nine. Okay, and surah Tawbah is uh, the surah revealed, uh, surah Anfal, the surah before was revealed uh, after the first major battle, the Battle of Badr. This surah is revealed building up to the last major battle, the Battle of Tabuk. So you can kind of see it's like these two surahs together. It's like the beginning of the Prophet's battles and like the end of his, you know, life and his battles. They kind of like bring the two together. Okay. Uh, this is the only surah that you notice does not begin with Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas say, says that, Sa'altu Ali ibn Abi Talib, Lima lam yuktab fi bara'a Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He asked Ali, who Ali is one of the great scholars of, uh, of course, the Prophet's son-in-law and the fourth Khalifa, but also one of the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba in the Quran. So Abdullah ibn Abbas asked Ali, why isn't Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim written before Surah Tawbah? He says, لِأَنَّ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أَمَانٌ وَبَرَاءَةٌ نَزَلَتْ بِالصَّيْفِ وَلَيْسَ فِيهَا أَمَانٌ He says, because Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a statement of peace, a declaration of peace. And this surah was revealed with the sword without any declaration of peace. This is a very tough surah. And again, you have to understand it in its context. Otherwise, if you are going to understand it out of context, you are going to uh, be, you would be misguided by it, right? You would take away a incorrect, underst incorrect understanding of this surah. Uh, it is, uh, you know, um, this, this surah is called Tawbah, Tawbah, because the word Tawbah comes 17 times in its root uh, in this surah, okay? Uh, implying that the door of Tawbah is open for all people, even if they have transgressed against the Prophet and fought the Prophet Sallallahu for, you know, decades, the door of Tawbah is still open for them and for all. Okay, but of course, it's not open forever. That's also an important thing to consider. Now, this surah begins with a very stern opening, ayah 1 to 5. Okay, look at that. This is a declaration of immunity from God and his messenger to the polytheist with whom you have made agreements. Right, so go about in the land for four months, but know that you cannot frustrate the plan of God and that God will disgrace those who deny the truth. And this is a proclamation from God and his messenger to the people on the day of pilgrimage that God is free of all obligation to the polytheist, and so is his messenger. So if you repent, it is better for you. But if you turn away, then know that you cannot frustrate the plan of God. Proclaim a grievous punishment for those who are bent on denying the truth. These are very stern ayat. These are very stern ayat, uh, in which the Prophet ﷺ, after his the battles with the people of the Arabian Peninsula are over. The Battle of Tabuk was with the Roman Empire, with the Byzantine Empire, okay? This is like the final declaration to the Arabian Peninsula. There is going to be no more polytheism allowed in this Arabian Peninsula, okay? This is the stern warning that this surah is giving. But notice, as it gives this stern warning about, uh, about uh, war, hmm? about waging war. It also mentions what? Tawbah, ayah number six. If one of the polytheists seeks asylum with you, grant him asylum. So that he may hear, hear the word of God. Then convey him to a place of safety. Right? Do not hold the sword at someone's throat and tell him, say the shahada. That's completely in, unacceptable. Okay? If a person who is a polytheist and he wants asylum, right? You are waging war against these people. He wants asylum, give him asylum. And give him asylum and give him the time to understand the deen. 
Allah. Let them hear the word of God, i.e. let them understand what the religion is about. And once they have understood it, you know, take them to a safe place where they can make up their mind, right? Even in the middle of the most stern ayat of Quran. This is the most stern ayat of Quran. That's what the surah is. Hmm? It is the most stern part of the Quran. Even in the middle of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this uh, exception that this is to be done to, for anybody who wants to repent, who wants to reform, because the Prophet was sent as a mercy to mankind. He was sent as a mercy to mankind. And before this took place, the people of Arabia had embraced Islam and, and, and alhamdulillah, it, 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 was, it was a matter that was uh, completed by the, uh, the, the, the permission and by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the reason why this is so stern is كَيْفَ وَإِنْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ These people who have... Uh, why, why, why is this so stern? كَيْفَ How... What's the reason for that? How can there be a treaty with the polytheists? I'm part of God and His messenger except for those whom you entered into a treaty at the sacred mosque. Okay? How can you that be the case? Because... If they get the upper hand over you, they will neither respect kinship nor covenant. They are going to try, they will kill you if they have that chance. That's how those people are. Okay. Now, this is not projecting over every person who is a polytheist or every disbeliever. This is specifically, as you can see, it's referring to a very specific time in the life of the Prophet. And it's referring to the specific people of the Arabian Peninsula who were at war with the Prophet ﷺ. And here, it's the explanation is very clear. These people, if they get the upper hand over you, they will kill you. They will not respect the ties of kinship uh, or uh, they will not respect covenant. They will not be like Quraysh. Quraysh did respect the treaty. Quraysh did have a little bit of regard. These people will not be like the Quraysh. So, and you notice that most of them are uh, are, are re uh, rebellious sinners. Okay, but there is still, uh, you know, there is still hope for in tabu, again tauba, right? If they repent and they keep up their prayers and they pay the zakat, then they are your brethren in faith. For ikhwanukum din. they become from your go from your enemy to your brethren to your brothers. Okay. This is the power of tawbah. This is the power of reform. That's what, the, that's what the Quran says. We make our messages clear for people who are willing to learn. Hmm? Uh, this is something uh, the, 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 the Quran expresses very clearly. This is a... I want you to please understand this and not, mis and not take these ayat out of the context. These ayat are revealed talking about the polytheists of the Arabian Peninsula after the Prophet ﷺ had uh, completed his business with the people of Mecca, the people of Quraysh. Okay, number one. Number two, it was very stern because this battle and it was, was ongoing for many, many, uh, for a while now, tw two decades plus. And now this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, motioning it to end it. Number three, these people were not like Quraysh. These people will not honor the treaty. They would, you know, do uh, things that will be completely, uh, you know, they will go against the rules the moment they get the chance. But despite all of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the, the door of tawbah was left open for the individual and for the communities who wanted this. And alhamdulillah, the, uh, this was the case for the vast majority of them. Okay. Ayah number 17. If you remember, I mentioned the uh, idea of the Quraysh uh, were um, were hesitant, right? Were hesitant uh, to um, accept Islam because theologically they had some problems, but also financially they were concerned, right? They were concerned uh, about what would happen if they had opened the doors uh, to polytheism and shut the doors on sorry, excuse me, if they open the door to monotheism and shut the doors on polytheism, will our numbers of hujjaj decrease? Will our customers become lesser now? So Allah SWT says, ayah number 28, Ya amanu, innam al The believers, uh, oh believers know that the polytheists are impure. Meaning what? Uh, they are impure in the sense like 
uh, med- like uh, spiritually, they are najis. You know, they are spiritually uh, impure, and their practices are impure. So it's not allowed for them to enter the sacred mosque. After this year onwards, okay. Uh, وَإِنْ خِفْتُ مَعِيلَةً If you should fear destitution, if you fear that you will run out of money, then understand God will enrich you of His bounty if He so wishes. He is aware and wise. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let you down. He will take care of you. And subhanAllah, the people did not decrease, they increased and increased to the point where before COVID, you can barely, <laughs> you can barely keep them all in the, in the haram. There was just flooding onto the street that's how many people would go to umrah and hajj uh, so this is allah's promise and we see its fulfillment with our eyes uh, today ayah number 29 speaks about uh, the people of the scripture and jizya before all the conversation was about polytheists mushrikun of the arabian peninsula but what about the christians and the jews of the arabian peninsula Right? What about them? What about the Christians and Jews outside the Arabian Peninsula as the Muslim areas of influence expand? Here is what uh, Allah says about that. Uh, fight those among the people of the book who believe neither in God nor in the last day, nor hold as unlawful what God has and his messenger has made has declared to be lawful, nor follow the true religion until they pay the tax willingly and they agree to submit. So the people of the scripture has the option of giving the jizya tax. The jizya is basically zakat for a non-Muslim person. You give this jizya and now there is no fighting. That's a peace deal. And it is the responsibility of the Muslim state to protect its non-Muslim subjects. And its non-Muslim subjects have full autonomy to practice their religion as they please. This was the thing, right? This is not like they can, uh, you know, go and, you know, the jizya is taken and now all of a sudden they're oppressed and they're second class citizens. No, the jizya is taken and now they are basically, uh, their religion, they can practice it freely. And they can still be part of the Muslim, uh, you know, empire, the Muslim uh, kingdom uh, as citizens of it protected by the state because they give jizya. This is the idea behind jizya. It's uh, the option was given because again, when this is the case, the, the Muslim empire, I was reading this tweet by this brother. He said the Muslims, you know, extended their influence over Baghdad in 670 CE approximately by, by the eighth century, a year, a century and a half, uh, or mid 9th century, only 18% of Iraq was Muslim, right? That means that shows historically what? It shows that the Muslims, when they uh, went and all these lands came under Muslim rule, the rule of, of Islam extended over all these lands. But the population, obviously the Muslims would grow uh, among them as uh, in the population. But it wasn't like everybody was, you know, their throats were slit if they didn't become Muslim. It wasn't the Spanish Inquisition. Hmm? It wasn't that. It was you stay, you pay jizya, you can remain faithful to your faith. You can remain a Christian. You can remain a Jew. And even the uh, Umar radiallahu did that with the Zoroastrians in in Persia. Zoroastrians were in a way polytheists. He accepted jizya from them as well. The idea being what? The idea being that as these people are living under the rule of Islam, they will see the values of Islam. They will see the goodness of Islam. They will see the goodness of the Muslims. And then naturally they will incline towards becoming Muslims. Okay. Uh, the Qur- uh, Quran, as you see, as this is going to happen, right? As Muslims are living with non-Muslims uh, and uh, especially Jews and Christians, and they get to interact with them. The Quran says, take heed from their theological corruption. Don't, don't become the- theologically corrupt like the Christians became. For example, uh, the Jews say Ezra is the son of God and Christians say the Messiah is the son of God. These are but baseless utterances. They imitate the asser- assertions made in earlier times by those who deny the truth. May God destroy them how far astray they have been led. 
they take, they have taken their learned men and their monks for their lords besides God. And so have they taken the Messiah, the son of Mary, although they were commanded to worship only one God. La ilaha illahu subhanahu amma yushrikun. Uh, he is the only one worthy of worship. And how far is he above what they set up as his partners? This is what happened. They would become influenced by the theology of the polytheists and the pagans around them, the Jews and the Christians, as they lived in the Byzantine Empire and in the Roman Empire. The paganism of the Romans seeped into Christianity. Okay, this is a historical thing. You could study this. The Quran is warning: don't let that happen to you as you are now living side by side with these communities. The Quran also warns that don't uh you know, don't take heed from their financial corruption. Okay. Believers, many religious scholars and monks wrongfully appropriate people's possessions and turn people away from God's path. Not all, كثيراً, many of them. Okay. Tell those who hoard gold and silver instead of giving it in God's cause that they will have a painful punishment. What is worse than somebody raising money for the sake of, in the name of religion, for the sake of God, and then putting it in their own pocket and benefiting it from themselves personally, right? There's nothing worse than that, uh, you know, in terms of financial corruption, because you have used the name of God, you have, you know, sullied the name of God, and you have used it to get rich, right? This is you know, like a double whammy if you think about it. Okay. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, yuhma fi nari jahannam. Look at the punishment that awaits people who does this. People of any people of the Jews and the Christians, the monks and the rabbis, and any Muslim who does similarly as well. Yawma yuhma alayha fi nari jahannam. On the day their treasure is heated hmm, up in the fire and their foreheads and their sides and their backs shall be branded with it. فَتُكْوَى بِهَا جِبَاهُهُمْ وَجُنُوبُهُمْ وَظُهُورُهُمْ هَذَا مَا كَنَسْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ This is what you hoarded up for yourselves. This is what you have earned. You know, you stole from the people and you stole in the name of God, pretend to be righteous and pious. This is what you have earned for yourselves. فَذُوْقُوا مَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْنِزُونَ Now taste the punishment of what you were, uh, you know, collecting and hoarding. A very, very stern ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, uh, if I can have a few minutes to speak a little bit about the hypocrites. The hypocrites are the other type of evil. Remember, good versus evil. There was the evil against the Prophet versus Quraysh. Hmm? The Prophet versus Quraysh. But the, also a, you know, a flavor of evil was the hypocrites who lived inside Medina, pretended to be Muslims, said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, but then they were the most bitter enemies of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, they were like uh, agents of the opposition from within, trying to undermine and overthrow the Prophet ﷺ from inside. Okay, Allah SWT says uh, here about the battle of Tabuk. Uh, this is one of the most difficult battles that the Prophet ﷺ ever fought, and this was against the Roman, uh, the Byzantine Empire. Okay, the eastern flank of the Roman Empire, and so this was a major battle. Uh, but here is what Allah says about it as he starts to talk about it. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ma lakum idha qila lakum unfiru fi sabilillahi thaqaltum ila al-ard. Believers, what is the matter with you? When you are asked to go forth in the cause of God, you cling to the land. Ithaqaltum ila al-ard. From the word thaqil, that's heavy. Like your feet are heavy. You're heavily clinging onto the earth. Right? What is that? What is this image? The image is Allah is asking you to go uh, and, you know, basically like fly towards heaven and you're clinging to the mud of this earth. You you, you want to, you prefer the life of this world to the hereafter, right? Is that the reason why? Hmm? But the comfort of this life compared to the next life is very little, insignificant almost. Hmm? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the believers that look, you should go to fight this battle, uh, this battle of Tabuk. The battle of Tabuk was actually a second skirmish between the Muslims and the Byzantines. The first one was the battle of Mu'ta, where the Byzantine Empire uh, came to the aid of Arab Christians. 
that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had sent a expedition to. And they overwhelmed the Muslims to the point where the number was like 1 to 10. And Khalid bin Walid very skillfully uh, maneuvered the Muslims and rescued them from certain massacre. Okay, So now to, to get revenge on these people for this kind of uh, shenanigans, the Prophet ﷺ was going to go to Tabuk and take care of business there. But before he went there, the preparation was a very difficult preparation. We'll speak about that more tomorrow too. But here, look at what he says. If you are the Sahaba, he's done the Sahaba. If you do not go forth, he will punish you sternly and replace you by other people. And you will not harm him in the least. It's your loss, not Allah's loss. Because Allah is powerful. If you don't help him, وسلم, Allah will help him anyway. This train is leaving the station, whether you're on it or not. Okay? Know how Allah supported him when those who denied the truth, the people of Makkah, the Quraysh, expelled him when the two of them were in the cave, Abu Bakr and Muhammad and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when he said to his companion, to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, لا تحزن إن الله معنا don't worry, for God is with us. This was the instance where they were alone at the, you know, if Quraysh found them, it was certain death. The Prophet ﷺ was escaping Mecca to go to Medina. And as he escaped Mecca to go to Medina, he took a detour as like a misdirection to hide in the cave of Thawr. And when he hid there with Abu Bakr Siddiq, the people of Quraysh found him anyway. And found the cave anyway. And had they found him, it would have been certainly, they, they would have killed him. Okay, so here he is without any army, without any arms, without anything, completely, you know, by himself with Abu Bakr Siddiq. Allah said in that helpless situation, right? World, from a worldly perspective, he was helpless. Allah saved him and protected him and gave him victory, right? If he could do that in that state, he's going to most certainly do that at the end of his life in the Battle of Tabuk. Whether you do it or not, O Sahaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to do it, uh, is going to support him and give him victory. Uh, so God sent his tranquility down on him and aided them with aided him with forces invisible to you and placed the word of those who disbelieved as the lowest while God's word remained supreme and God is powerful and wise. Right. So this is the battle of Tabuk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then talk about a bit of the analysis of the hypocrites, right? I'll give you some examples of that. I number 47, right? The hypocrites. Had they gone forth with you, they would have only proved a source of evil for you and would have run back and forth among you, seeing, seeking to sow discord among you. And among you, were some who would have willingly listened to them. They would have been bad influences in your army, O Prophet. This is a very, very, this is a very powerful ayah. I always am blown away by it. Hmm? Because it says the Sahaba, the Sahaba would be influenced by the hypocrites and would be adversely, negatively affected by these people. Because Allah says, had they gone forth, hypothetically, if they were there, they would have become a source of evil and discord because some of the Sahaba would have listened to them. How, imagine the effect of, of bad influence and negativity on the rest of us who are not Sahaba, who don't have the protection of seeing the Prophet ﷺ and hearing the truth from his mouth. Right? Imagine the consequences, uh, and not just imagine, you can see the consequences of misinformation that when people spread it, it spreads like wildfire and the truth is now smashed by it. It's smashed by it because the people are willing to listen to these spicy fake news, these half-truths and are so influenced by them that, uh, that the truth doesn't even matter to them. A very, uh, you know, it's a very sobering reality, right? Another one is ayah number 65. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
sorry, I number 65, not 465. Uh, 65 is uh, they were insulting the Prophet, right? Making fun, making a mockery of them, making a mockery of their appearances. And Allah says, Would you make a mockery of God and his messengers? God and his revelations and of his messenger? That is tantamount to blasphemy and disbelief, making excuses you have rejected faith after you accepted it. Right? So this is that. We'll pick up some more of this information, some more of this tomorrow. The analysis of the hypocrites, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, uh, the battle of Tabuk, and then into the last part of Surah Tawbah, inshallah, tomorrow. Same time, same place. Jazakallah khair, everybody, for sticking around till the end. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh.